Right, hello everyone. Thank you very much for coming along. Um, I really mean that because there is some incredible people talking today and some amazing talks. So the fact that you all took the time out of your day to come and see me talk today genuinely means quite a lot. Um, this presentation was marked as PG when I was writing it. I realised some things might not be entirely PG. Um, so I have put a little content warning in there. If anyone wants to, to leave now, I would not be offended. There will be um, themes such as online crime, extortion, um, suicide, etc. mentioned during this presentation. Nothing too graphic, though. Um, right, so what are we going to be covering off today? Um, I'm first of all going to look a little bit um, into the kind of current threat landscape, um, current um, kind, of, kind of ongoings online in terms of how Fake profiles are being used um, in the wild. Um, we're then going to play a little game of spot the difference. So everyone get your arms at the ready um, to, to get involved in that one. About spotting the difference between a real and an artificially generated face. Sounds easy. We'll see how we get on though. Um, we're then going to have a look at um, what we know as GAN. So for anyone who doesn't know, that's generative adversarial networks. Um, basically, how do we create these fake faces that we're going to be looking at? Then we're going to look at a solution. So is it possible computationally to tell the difference between a legitimate or a artificially generated face? So before we move on, um, who am I? I think there's a few familiar faces in the audience. Um, but for those who don't know me, my name is Jess, not Jessica. Um, if you call me Jessica, I'll probably look away. Um, if you want to follow me on Twitter, my Twitter is there. Um, I know that there might be some stuff here where people want to follow up or just want to have a chat, follow me there. Um, currently, I am the interim SOC lead and um, threat intel lead at the WEIR group. Again, for anyone who doesn't know, um, the, the best way to describe what WEIR does is we take big rocks out the ground and mine them and build them into big things. Mining and engineering company. Um, started there last year, but this presentation in no way, um, kind of usual disclaimer, this is my views, not my employer's. Um, 2020 ethical hacking graduate at Aberté in Dundee, um, where security is formed. If anyone's ever been to security, another great conference. Um, on kind of sh shameless plug there. Um, I was the ex president up there of the society that organises security, so maybe slightly biased on that one. Privacy advocate, lover of dash hounds, nothing like a good dog. Um, also a disclaimer here: not a machine um, learning expert just like machine learning. Um, there's definitely people who are so experienced in this field and understand all the, the background maths and, and the kind of complex beneath the surface um, kind of calculations and code that, that's part of these algorithms. This for me was a, a bit more of a passion project, to be honest. Um, and the reason I put that photo at the side there is because even though I graduated in 2020, um, thank you to covid I actually only got my graduation ceremony last week, so felt like I needed to shout that out. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> um, and on that point, a story of this research. So this research was actually um, the work that I completed as part of my undergraduate thesis um, in my final year. So describe the tale in pictures. Um, I was at uni having the best time with uh, my friends. My best friend Lucy's here today. Um, having a great time going out on a Tuesday night smiling and then all of a sudden COVID hit um, during my final year, my final uh, uh, term and we all went to working from home. So I completed uni working from home and suddenly what was going to be a really cool and interesting final year um, turned into not what I thought it was going to be anyway and I um, submitted my dissertation from my bedroom at my mum's house. But we moved, we got our, uh, we got our dissertation done now and we finally graduated, which is great. Um, special thanks before we move on as well to Dr. Natalie Cool, um, Dr. Sonas Kavanapur and to Aberdeen University as well. Um, they really supported this project, so we wouldn't have happened at all without them. So, background, um, how can fake profiles use, uh, be used online? Probably sounds like quite a, a simple question, especially for everyone here. Um, but nevertheless, um, so Daniel Perry, 17 years old, Amanda Todd, 15 years old, Ronan Hughes, 17 years old. 
what do these uh, uh, ve- very young people have in common? Um, these young people, um, according to a study that was completed um, by the Crimes Against Children Research Centre um, and the University of, of New Hampshire, found that these um, three young people were all subject um, to to what we can only be described as very sophisticated um, social engineering. So all three of these teenagers were um, befriended by individuals online that were not who they said they were. These people were pressured into, um, or, or, or lured rather, into sharing images and, and videos of themselves. Um, they were then threatened um, by, by those who befriended them that if they did not pay quite um, a substantial sum of money that these images would be um, shared publicly. All three of these teenagers very sadly commit suicide as a result of these events. That's the reality of extortion online. This is what is happening with these fake profiles and and what this study found is that 55% of participants um, who who kind of were subject to these sort of acts stated that those who they were speaking to online um, gave them a false impression of who they were. So these are not real people for the most part. These are these are people who are falsifying their images. They are pretending to be younger, pretending to be older, changing their profile photos. I've got a quick video here, um, if it decides to work. The sound might not, but it should have some... Gordon Peel created this fake video of President Obama to demonstrate how easy it is to put words in someone else's mouth. Moving forward, we need to be more vigilant with what we trust from the internet. Not everyone bought it, but the technology behind such frauds is rapidly improving, even as worries increase about their potential for harm. This is your Bloomberg Quick Take on Deep Fakes. Deepfakes, or realistic-looking fake videos and audio, gained popularity as a means of adding famous actresses into porn scenes. Despite bans on major websites, they remain easy to make and find. They're named for the deep-learning artificial intelligence algorithms that make them possible. Input real audio or video of a specific person, the more the better, and the software tries to recognize patterns in speech and movement. Introduce a new element like someone else's face or voice, and a deepfake is born. It's actually extremely easy to make one of these things. There were just some supposed, you know, breakthroughs from academic researchers who work with this particular kind of machine learning in the past few weeks, which would drastically reduce the amount of video you need actually to create one of these. Programs like Fake App, the most popular and widely available for making deep fakes, need dozens of hours of human assistance to create a video that looks like this rather than this. In August, researchers at Carnegie Mellon revealed software that accurately rendered not just facial features, but changing weather patterns and flowers in bloom. This advance is not yet available to the public. But with increasing capability comes increasing concern. You know, this is kind of fake news on steroids, potentially. Um, We do not know of a case yet where someone has tried to use this to perpetrate a a kind of fraud or an information warfare campaign, or, or for that matter, to really damage someone's reputation. But it's the danger that everyone is really afraid of. In a world where fakes are easy to create, authenticity also becomes easier to deny. People caught doing genuinely objectionable things could claim evidence against them is bogus. Fake videos can also be difficult to detect, though researchers around the world and at the U.S. Department of Defense have said they're working on ways to counter them. Deep fakes do, however, have some positive uses. Take Sarah Proc, a firm that creates digital voices for people who lose theirs from disease. Speech synthesis is the artificial production of human speech. There are also applications that could be considered either good or bad, like the many, many deep fakes that exist solely to turn as many movies as possible into Nicolas Cage movies. Oh, <laughs> right, okay, so I, I thought it was quite important to, to put that in there. Um, I'm sure we've all seen deep fakes somewhere, right? Whether that's your best friend, your mum, your dad, sharing a video on Facebook of Nicolas Cage or Barack Obama, doing something um, that they might not usually, right? Um so, moving on from there, beyond deepfakes, so deepfakes themselves, traditionally, right now, we're looking at altering images that exist of legitimate characters, um, quite often, 
popular characters, um, politicians, movie stars, etc. But let me introduce you to my friend Katie Jones here. Hello, Katie. So, Katie um, has a degree in Russian studies from Michigan University. Um, Katie is employed at the Center um, for Strategic International Studies, and Katie has a growing LinkedIn um, network currently sitting at 49 Connections. But what if I told you that Katie Jones didn't actually exist? So, um, in 2019, the Associated Press published an article reporting that Miss Katie Jones here um, was actually an artificially generated image. Um, Katie Jones's face does not exist. Katie Jones is not a person. Katie Jones is not human. Um, but Katie Jones had um, started to build up quite an impressive network on LinkedIn, connecting with prominent members of DC think tanks, um, including the former Deputy Director of President Donald Trump's Domestic Policy Council. So while there was a lot of speculation um, about Miss Katie Jones and, and what her aim was, um, it, it's likely that this was part of um, a, a kind of wider scale cyber espionage campaign. And this is, in the wild, one of the first examples that we have, have seen or, or first publicly known examples where an artificially generated face is being used as part of social engineering campaigns. So, like I said, get your get your arms at the ready. So now I've introduced you to Katie. Let's see how we would um, respond when it comes to spotting the difference between a legitimate face and an artificially generated face. So, right, hands up if you think this uh, face is real, if you think that this lady is real. Hands up. Right. Okay. Right. And hands up if you think she's fake. Okay, right. So more people think she's real. By and by. She's fake. She, she, she is, she is not a real person. Um, uh, and some of this is actually getting beyond what it was. So the technology that, um, is behind generating these images is improving at such a fast rate. Previously, you might not be able to include things like, um, earrings or sunglasses. That, that's rapidly changing. So let's move on to our next one. Take a yes. Right. Hands up if you think that this lovely lady here is real. <laughs> right, now we're not so sure. We're not so sure. Right, okay. And hands up if you think she's fake. And hands up if you just don't know. If you're not sure. Okay, right. She is fake. She is a fake face. This little girl. Right, real? Hands up. Fake? Not so sure. Most people not so sure, yep. She's actually fake and um, as part of the research that I'd done, I looked at how people responded to these faces. Um, what we done is um, we took quite um, a, a large number of participants and we provided them a series of images, two faces at once, and got them to select which one they thought was real which they thought was fake. Um, and we will come on to the results of that shortly. However, what we did find is that quite often when it came to um, kind of children uh, and those that were maybe a wee bit younger or specifically those who are a little bit older, people found it harder to tell the difference, right? Because in your head you're going, well, surely not, surely not. It's almost hard to believe that that, that is not a real human face, right? Next one. Real? Hands up. What do we think? Fake. Okay, right. Not got a clue, people. Right, yeah, we're still we're still a little bit unsure. This is a real man. <laughs> this is a real man. Um, and I would like to point out that all the um, real faces that are going to be used during um, this presentation were taken from a legitimate online repository where you do have permission to take them. I'm not just um, a, a strange person who's taking photos off people's Facebook profiles, but... We move on. Right, our next man. What do we think? Real? Fake? I can see a little bit of discussion. Talk amongst yourselves if you like you should. Right, let's hands up for real. Hands up for fake. Okay, we're starting to do a little bit better. Not not too sure. Okay, yep, so this man is actually is actually fake, so he's done he's done quite well on that one. And um, I don't know if there was any kind of telltale signs that anyone wants to point out. Uh, yep. Yep. 
anywhere you wouldn't, your eyes are drawn to, so like the neck, the side of the photo, so where the, the hair is, you know, it's like a pretty pattern. Yep. All over the back. Yep. So pupils aren't round. Yep. Yeah. Just feel like we're all going to be coming out this talk very um, kind of criticising everyone's face <laughs> looking, at them, <laughs> looking at their nostrils um, but yep correct this this man is indeed a fake face and the interesting um, point to make with with this image um, I specifically took this using the um, new generator that's available so it's supposed to look a little bit more realistic um, compared to the past images kind of a little bit more I don't want to say dishevelled <laughs> um, that's, that's maybe quite harsh um, but less kind of airbrushed, more legitimate human human kind of features on their facial hair, wrinkles, and so on. Okay, so when we look at the results of the survey that was taken, 42% um, percent of survey participants, they found differ- differentiating these images difficult. And I don't blame them. Most people did find it difficult. And if we go and look into that in a bit more detail, um, these participants got asked... Um, what their technical competency was. So based on technical competency, how did people find it? And if we look at, um, on average, um, those with lower technical competency or those who assess themselves as having um, lower technical competency, they found it harder to tell the images apart. Apart from um, one novice user who claimed it was really super easy, but spoiler, they actually got them all wrong. So <laughs> that, that tells a nice story there. Um General trend, though, technical competency did not have much of a sway on on how people were actually able to classify these images. So let's look at results. So success rate, as you can see, across the board, not a lot of difference. Um, You've got kind of your highest success rate set in about 46%, um, your lowest success rate there set in about 39%. So, So it's not... It's not high, right? And that's your success rate. So more often than not, people were getting these these questions wrong. People were struggling. So, in summary, it's really hard. It's really, really hard. We've got to remember that the technology behind creating these images is, is vastly improving. It's becoming more complex. So while it's hard now, tomorrow and the next day, it's going to be even harder, right? So let's look a little bit about um, at, at the how. So... For those who aren't aware of this site, browse to it, have a play about. It's quite fun. Um, you can generate a, a legitimate face um, with the click of a button. So this person does not exist.com. Um, and this um, person does not exist.com is powered by um, an algorithm that we know as StyleGAN. So what do we mean by StyleGAN? What is a generative adversarial network? So Dr. Jason Brownlee once said, um, he's a very, very smart man, PhD, um, and does a lot of kind of open source writing about machine learning, helping um, very inexperienced programmers like me try to understand the, the complexities that are going on in, in the background. Um, he once said that generative adversarial networks are an approach to generative modeling using deep learning methods such as neural networks. <sighs> right? Lots of big words in there that I did not understand at first. So let's break it down. What's a GAN? So generative modeling itself is an unsupervised learning task. So it's a task that we can leave a computer to perform by itself. Um, It involves discovering and detecting patterns to form new examples. So what we're saying is that if we feed a generative adversarial network a large data set, what it will do is it will go through that data, whatever that is, whether it's images, whether it's text, whatever. In this case, we're talking images. We'll look at these images and it will detect patterns, abnormalities, and it will use that to create new images, right? So these GANs are performed um, or, or made up rather of two components, um, the generator and the discriminator. So the generator, that's what we train. So we train this generator to make new examples, right? And the discriminator, what it will do is it tries to classify if these images in this case are real, so from the the domain that we provided, or fake, come from the generator. And what we do when we're training training a GAN is we say once that success rate is is above kind of 50%, so we're able to trick that that discriminator network more than 50% of the time, do what? It's not too bad. It's pretty much trained, right? And the closer that we can get that to 100%, the closer we can get to tricking 
um, that discriminator network into not being sure over what's part of the original data set and what's part of the new data set. That's what we want, right? A meme for your for your pleasure. I, I felt quite impressed with myself when I started to understand machine learning memes. Um, so when in your training again, you do kind of feel a bit like the overlord because you're going, ha ha, I am playing both of you so that we all do well here. We all do well. Um, if we go on to look a little bit about um, StyleGAN. So StyleGAN specifically, it was developed by NVIDIA in 2019. And it demonstrates the unsupervised learning of high-level human attributes with stochastic um, variation. So what we mean by that is high-level attributes, by and by, right? I know we're probably all going to come out of here and be looking very in detail at each other's faces, but um, high-level human attributes, we mean every face has a nose, every face has an eye, a set of eyes, every face has ears, so on and so forth. By stochastic variation, what we mean is um, some people might have freckles, right? Some people might have green eyes, some people might have blue eyes, some people might have bushy eyebrows, some people might have an eyebrow, depending. Um, so that's what StyleGAN does. It takes these high-level attributes and it implements differences in them so you get a different face with different kind of known features every single time. Readily available technology, like I said before, um, not only does it power this person does not exist.com, but you can also go and have a play about with it on um, GitHub. I would really recommend that if anyone comes out this presentation and thinks this is actually really interesting. The research is all there and um, they're very open about how, how they've done it. You can go in, you can run the script yourself, you can create your own fake face, you can look at the code that they've used to do it. So put a little link in there for anyone who is interested. So let's look at kind of at a high level what the research says is this formula, right? X equals gen of Z, and I don't mean gen Z in there, gen of Z. Um, and what we're saying there is where X equals the images created, so that's our output. Um, G equals our lovely generator network that we have spoke through. And Z equals the latent features of the images created. So hypothetically, what we're saying is that combining the output of the generator um, against the latent features of the images um, generated, you'll form a new data set. So let's look at the proposed solution. Like I say, we've got we've got a bit of a problem here because this technology that, that's behind generating these images is improving at such a vast rate and it's only a matter of time as... Um, that the video that I showed earlier alluded to that this is going to be used in malice. We have seen some images in the wild so far, but it's only a matter of time before people click on to why would I use Barack Obama's face when I can create an entirely new persona? Something that comes to mind to me, and apologies if this is incredibly high level for folks. Don't know if anyone remembers the uh, TV show Catfish by MTV. Yeah, yeah. And um, they would sit there and they would reverse image search the the profile photo and it would come up right because they more often than not would take photos from someone else um, and that was quite a telltale self sign for them on whether or not that profile was legitimate if you used a fake human face one that does not exist does not have an online persona and could create a new one at the click of a button coupled with the deep fake technology that we've now got to merge those human faces onto videos why would you not right like, why would you use something that you might get caught versus something that's readily available? So what I've tried to do within this research is build up quite a lightweight model that detects between what is real and what is fake. So a little overview of it here. Um, it was written in Python um, using the Keras Deep Learning API. The reason that we use this is because it provides a whole host of native features um, that is easily accessible for those who are not familiar with the deep workings of machine learning and deep learning. Something that, to be quite honest with you, is quite good for beginners. Um, something that's quite good if you don't want to spend too much time having to build out your own functions and it's something that's readily available, it's open source, it's free. Um, VGG16 as a base model um, and that was pre-trained using the ImageNet um, database. So the reason I used the base model in this case um, Training your own deep learning model for 
for looking at image classification would take millions of images. I did not have millions of images. So what I'd done was that I took a pre-trained base model, but I looked at building a new classifier on the top of it. So ImageNet um, is essentially a classifier that's built off of um, WordNet, where phrases and words are split into meaningful categories. Um, ImageNet assigns images to these categories um, and then these categories are basically sorted and labelled um, and then used to train a base model. Training set, I had 40,000 images for training, so that was 20,000 real, 20,000 fake. Um, testing set of 4,000, again, split in half. And an evaluation set of 1,000, again, split in half. Um, use StyleGAN to generate the fake images. So um, I, I referenced the GitHub site earlier on there. Um, just ran the script, managed to get as many fake images as I, I would like. Um, Flickr Faces HQ for real faces. Um, like I say, if anyone wants to um, volunteer their Facebook profile picture, I would be open. But um, no, it is really, really very difficult to get large data sets um, that are kind of signed off by university ethics to use as part of um, training in this case. Um, trained on a MacBook Pro. Um, I'll come on to that a little bit later. Um, this was supposed to be trained on a far larger, more powerful computer um, that became unavailable because of COVID and working from home. So it was trained on my MacBook Pro. Bear that in mind when you look at the results. Um, and how the image um, classifier at a very high level worked. Uh, worked from extracting features for images and then applying binary labels as an output. Some dogs, because when I was writing this um, presentation at this point, I felt we might need some some dogs. So just um, <laughs> for no other reason, no other reason than um, just just cause. Are they real? They are. They're real dogs. <laughs> I, I promise. I promise you. Um, uh, we've, we've got Lola and then we've got Marley, um, the dash round. So, yeah, we, they, these are all real dogs, I promise. So let's look at um, the solution that we decided to build. So I ended up building two solutions. Um, the first being optimised to run on a CPU. Um, so like I say, these classifiers, they leveraged feature extraction, um, pre-trained on the VGG16 base um, neural network model. And essentially what the feature extraction consisted of in this instance um, was using representations learned from that previous network to form some new samples and, and to look at reclassifying the images that it was being fed. Um, we then passed that new data set through the base and built that classifier on the top. Um, the extracted features of the images were then stored and used to identify what is a typical real and what is a typical fake face. Sounds pretty reasonable, right? Um, this is what the <laughs> the results looked like. Um, so that very thick blue line um, at the top was what the model performed at during training. So performed quite well. It achieved accuracy of about 0.97, which is as close to 100% as you're really going to get. However, that comes with a bit of a caveat. Um, when we fed that, the testing data, um, it dropped by 20% on unseen data. And um, my current hypothesis is working that if I fed even more data, that would continue to drop. Um, the model was overfitting um, and overfitting in machine learning terms is when the model learns the detail and the noise of the training data too much. It becomes too familiar with that training set that you've provided it that when you provide it new data, it just kind of goes, ah, don't know what to do with this. Um, but that likely came about, like I say, as, as a result of a limited data set um, if I had more images this possibly could work a little bit better. But I had to go back to the drawing board. So in the absence of more images, I had to rethink um, and I came up with this. So something that was a bit more optimised to run on a GPU, something that needed a little bit more power, um, worked in 
a similar way. Um, so using feature extraction, the same pre-trained um, base model. And it's probably worth pointing out here as well that VGG16 is potentially a slightly outdated model. It's, it's not very, very recent. However, it has been um, documented as yielding very um, good results, which is why we used it in this case. And it was also um, something that has a lot of documentation behind it. But they do have VGG19 as well, which is a little bit a little bit newer. So um, this model itself will use data augmentation. So with feature extraction partnered with data augmentation, and what we mean by that is if we take our images and we apply slight different tweaks on them instead of getting new images. So if we take an image and we go, right, let's flip it. Let's crop part of it out. Let's turn it right round on its head. Let's warp it a little bit suddenly you've got a new data set, but without actually gathering more images. Um, this model aimed to account for the small data set that we had, um, and again, extracted features um, and used the binary labels that we previously identified to classify what is a typical real and what is a typical fake face. These were the results, which I will explain. So, in the training training portion um, of this, this research, we got about 0.83%-ish accuracy rates. It's not bad. Um, testing? Unsteady, to say the least. Um, so that line that's going kind of up and down and up and down and up and down, um, it wasn't enough to, to say that this model would work, but we, we're confident that if given more kind of resource. So if I trained this on a computer that was better than my six-year-old MacBook Pro, um, this would have likely yielded better results. However, what we can see from these results is that there's less overfitting. So that model, that gap between kind of what was um, the testing and what was the validation is kind of slowly starting to, to go down. Um, while we can see that it's unsteady, the model does demonstrate less evidence of overfit, and those lines are closer together. Again, right, so the, GA the GAN performance, um, there's a lot of different factors that go into building a deep learning model, right? You can, there's probably boundless and endless numbers of features and functions you can tweak, you can change, you can play about with to get that model to as close to 100% as what you can get. But this is what I focused on, right? So long and the short is that it took a lot of tuning, um, a lot of a lot of iterations, um, but the three kind of main variables that I focused on changing were the number of epochs, so... What that means is essentially the number of iterations ran through during training. So that is the number of times that the algorithm will work through the entire sample set during training. Um, and this was altered with each prototype until an optimal solution was achieved um, or as close to optimal as we could, we could get um, with the model showing as limited um, overfitting or underfitting as possible. Batch size. Um, so batch size refers to the number of images that are passed through the model during an, an iteration, essentially. So a small batch size in this case for this specific research works a little bit better. Um, a small batch size takes less memory um, and typically resulted in faster training times as the weights were updated on the model that little bit quicker. Um, and the learning rate. Um, arguably in this case, um, the learning rate was definitely the most important variable. Um, note there, very important. Glad I put that on the slide because it is very, very important. Um, so it controls how much the model can be changed in response to error. So we mentioned earlier about those two kind of generator and discriminator networks that are almost playing a bit of a cat and mouse game. What we don't want is if the model goes, no, 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 this is wrong or this is right, for them to suddenly jump up or down either end of the scale. We want only tiny little changes to be made to the um, the weights 
and the classifier each iteration we don't want it to be jumping up jumping down because that's not productive for anyone right then it's just going to end up jumping up and down the scale and never really yielding um very very high results so um we used again keras like i mentioned earlier provides um a lot of native features that are great for easily implementing um things like adaptive learning. So adaptive learning, um, like I say, in this case, refers to the model being able to respond better to changes within that data set. So, for example, if we had an image come in where someone was wearing sunglasses or a woman had earrings in or um, we had very brightly coloured hair, we want them to not treat that as a differentiator but more integrate that into, into our set. In this case, we used RMS prop um, as the optimizer. So, um, limitations again: <laughs> do not ever try um, to train an image classification model on a MacBook Pro. I learned the hard way. Um, my MacBook has never been the same. <laughs> I pretty much fried it, um, but it lives to tell the tale. Um, so, like I've mentioned, and I feel like I keep um, probably harping on. The data set was extremely limited, um, so this model is restricted in the fact that it demonstrates a novel proof of, proof of concept that it is computationally possible to tell the difference between these images. However, in order to validate th those results, we would need more images. It is also specific to one algorithm, and um, this is only looking at style and generated images. Um, there are more algorithms out there, and I'm sure as this research progresses, there will be even more, uh, and that number will continue to grow. Um, how this specific model would respond to images generated using um, different algorithms, I don't know. Um, I would love to know. Um, it's definitely an area for this work to move into in the future. And like I say, it was definitely trained in an environment absolutely not fit for purpose, but we gave it a go. <laughs> Um, so, advancements. Um, Stelgan 2 has been released. On this next slide, I've got some useful resources for anyone who, after this, wants to do some reading about this technology, how it works, um, and some of the really, really interesting academic papers that there are out there. However, Stelgan 2, um, it demonstrates the ability to make these images even more lifelike. Um, and that quality, like I say, is continuing to improve. Um, deep fake, fake technology and image manipulation again continuing to advance um, and the long and the short is that detection technology and as security professionals we must do better to look at solutions on how to counteract this. Useful resources, um, I'll leave this up on the screen if anyone wants to take some photos, um, I'm not sure if the slides will be going out somewhere, I'll try to put them somewhere after, uh, but yep, yeah, resources are here and um, like I say, I've, I put my Twitter, I'll leave this up for a minute, but I have put my Twitter on the next slide. So if anyone does ever have any questions or wants to speak about this research in more detail, please let me know. I could probably speak about it all day if I if I was given the opportunity. Um, perfect. I will move on to questions. I know we've finished up a little bit early there, but if anyone does have any questions, happy to know. Yep. To be quite honest, I think it would depend on how good or bad your Photoshop skills were, to be honest. Um, so quite a lot of the telltale signs when it comes to um, artificially generated images comes to facial features, um, so I know we were talking about nostrils earlier. Um, nostrils are definitely a good one because they tend to be slightly maybe warped or pulled to one side. Ears, another one, um, generating ears because as much as we think an ear is an ear, an ear is very hard to kind of reproduce. Um, so if your Photoshop skills involved kind of tweaking areas of, of that kind of face that we might typically associate with an artificially generated face, then yes, it might end up going into the, the wrong bucket. But if it was just standard kind of covering up a spot or making your hair look a little bit blonder and your tan look a little bit darker, it would probably be fine. Yes? Would you 
agree or view your database or cache things as helps with being able to find out um, you know, deep fake and people who make fake images? Do you know what? I think it depends because if you hash the image, you really need to be looking at the characteristics of the image itself. While it would be great if we could have kind of a central repository where, I'm assuming you mean as in we have a central, yeah, people could go up and search this hashed image, but they're so easy to reproduce that if someone went, oh, my fake face has appeared on a known site of GAN images, oh, I need to create another one. All you need to do is refresh a web page. So, yep, absolutely. It could definitely feed into counteracting it. But because the technology now is so accessible, I think that if someone saw their image come up there, they would just simply create a new one. Yes, sir. Oh, I was going to ask. So, you look at human faces to discriminate differences. Yeah? Yep. Would an alternative approach just be um, a reverse engineer the um, current algorithm to be faced with how they do it? With the, Characteristic, and maybe the data set or two, just generate a huge data set using the current methods and shove it through the same sort of model so then it can actually, instead of saying that's a human, not, not a fake, how about that's just a fake, that's a fake, that's a fake? Would that be a better approach? So I did consider this um, within the kind of research model. However, the conclusion that I came to is that because there's so many algorithms out there, that if you went down that route, it would be very, very specific to an algorithm. And while I can hypothesize about the classifier that I built may not respond as well when fed other algorithms, if it can classify, yes, this is absolutely a human face, it'll put it still into the right bracket, whereas that kind of middle ground of how it'll respond with um, images generated using new algorithms is a bit of a grey area. But at least we can say for certain that yes, it classifies a human face correctly. Does that make sense? Yeah. Both of that the part. Instead of focusing on the face, we focus on the other um obviously made that the characteristics of the photograph that was common with human like taking photos, such as this the algorithm may just focus on the you know, the fidelity of the human face, symmetry and um, abnormalities or whatever we want to do, but we may not focus so much on the lighting to the same extent. Yeah, so the algorithm that I put together is in the classifier. It did look at the entire photo. It didn't just kind of specifically look at the eyes, the nose. It, it did look at the entire scene because what we found was that more often than not, in artificially generated images, the background's very warped. Um, it's it's very rare that you'll be able to get an image that has a perfect scenic backdrop that's um, generated by a computer. Um, so, yep, that is entirely kind of in in consideration. Yes? And I know you're talking about fake generation of face, but is mm -hmm. there any experiment that someone has out there, or is there any data on that someone has generated a face using deep fake and then realised, oh, it's actually a real person? <laughs> so, as in someone has generated a face using the algorithm, then a re done a reverse search and then realised it's an actual person out there. <laughs> no, I don't. I don't think so. Um, as far as as far as I know, because obviously the people don't exist. Um, if there is one, it would be quite interesting to see if someone was refreshing the the page and they suddenly saw my doppelganger. That would be pretty cool. <laughs> Yes. If we created a way of being able to detect these fake photos, would that, I'm assuming that would allow us to build a better classifier and therefore a better fake photo generator? Yes. Uh, how, how do you see that problem being solved? I think that's a problem that comes with anything in security, isn't it? When, when we work out how to detect a strain of malware, for example, or we develop a really good threat hunt within an environment, your actors are just going to circumvent it but again, we're relying right now anyway, because the research is so limited, on that low-hanging fruit, on that initial kind of classification. But yeah, absolutely. Definitely, definitely a problem. Yes. I, I saw um, on Twitter, I saw this line, what GAN images specifically from um, mm -hmm. this person does not exist. And it showed all of the eyes were in a line. They had three pictures in the top and then three in the bottom. And it, it matched this way and it matched this way on all of the pictures exactly the eye placement. Did you have the same issue when you were doing this, when you were generating the fake images where the eyes would all line up 
in, in a weirdly symmetric way. Yeah, so I did try to kind of sense check the faces that were coming out of the generator um, to make sure that they were at least of reasonable quality because some that I put up, they had like an ear for like a nose and stuff, um, <laughs> which was not great. Um, so I did do some sense checking, but yeah, the, without a doubt, because the data set was so big, I couldn't manually go through every single one, but I didn't find too many issues within it, um, to be honest. I think it depends on what algorithm you use to generate them, what machine you generate them on, um, and a lot of those kind of hyperparameters that, that we discussed. There's so many variations that you can do. So I didn't specifically have that issue, but I can see how people absolutely would. <laughs> yes, sir? Um, given that you were able to get some success on just the MacBook, um, yep. is there any technical limitations that would spot like social media companies and trying to solve this? Because um, I'm thinking actually if profiles were flagged as in person, if it's not real, that would probably cut down a lot of stuff, right? So if there was any technical why they were do that, or do you think it's just business reasons why they I think that it's something that is such new, in, in the grand scheme of things, it's such new technology that for me personally, it would be computationally possible. That was the aim of this research, was to prove it would be computationally possible. And my answer is yes, you can. So, yep. Absolutely. I, I think it's something that social media companies and financial industries, etc., should be should be looking at, um, w- without a doubt. Um, yep. Yes. So, of course, uh, being that machine learning will always be a bias, so we don't really know what your model is training or what it's catching on to. If we eventually develop a system that can detect fake reports, be it fake or real, what do we do for false positives? What if a machine determines that someone has something, we don't know what it is because it's specific bias, that will always make the trade as a fake person if we can do the person is absolutely real? How do we handle that? For example, if you mm-hmm. control if your um, social profile says, oh, this person is definitely fake, how do you, as a person, you will authenticate against the same model over and over again, fail to prove that you actually do this? I was going to make a joke about MFA there, but I probably shouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's it's one of those problems, right? And I think that without a doubt, if uh, there's no way that major social media companies are going to take my research on and go, yep, this is how we're going to do it. Yeah. Um, yeah. However, if they were to kind of use a, a similar model, it just needs tuning. So whatever that bias is, and we identify, okay, right, these types of profiles are getting flagged folks with these specific facial characteristics are getting put into the wrong bracket. Go back, rinse and repeat. I think that's always the same with machine learning, no matter. I can imagine it also has an impact on your training size or your actual use size. If you have a model that's like 99.99% fine, it's great. But for a profile that has, for a platform, let's say, Facebook, that's still thousands of people that yep. will still be black. Yeah, without a doubt. Without a doubt. There is such a thing as a perfect model, or would always be a... No, I think there's never going to be such a thing as a perfect model. What I tried to do to kind of circumvent some of those problems was to make sure that the data set was diverse, so making sure you had different ethnic ethnicities in there, different genders, different ages, to try and overcome that bias. If it was all blonde-haired 24-year-old females... It would have definitely been biased. Um, however, I did try to counteract that a little bit with what I'd done, but I imagine, like I say, the larger the data set is and the more that you fine tune it, the lower that margin for error would be. Okay. I'm cautious of, uh, yeah, no, still got time, I think. Yes, sir. You talked about how the technology can generate you just get, get better all the time. Yep. Did you do any testing, or are you aware of anyone doing any testing of, like, taking a classifier and saying, this is the performance degradation when you say you take a really old method and generate deep fakes versus the, the later, better ones, and how 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 much worse did the classifiers perform versus better and better deep fakes? I considered it as part of my research. I can implement it, um, but no, I'm not aware of anyone doing that research at the moment. I did try and see if there was anything I could reference, um, any material there, but not currently but definitely like I kind of touched on there it was one of the limitations of the model that it was specific to one generator but yeah absolutely it's something that needs to be done in the future is to look at over time how better it performs is it specific to images even what would happen potentially if you 
took images generated from different algorithms, put them in one data set, and then try and train that way potentially. Um, yes. If everyone has say, some ideas and some and real people's images and things and put them together, surely that would bypass a lot of uh, the uh, sort of algorithms. When you see a picture, they're not physically good. So you, you can recognise them, but if the elements of the person that have been used are actually from another person, then that image would be more likely to stand up. So part of the research was looking at how individuals respond to artificially generated faces and based on the sample set that was taken, people were actually unable to classify the difference between an artificially generated face and a human face. Um, I don't know what would happen if you kind of tried to, I don't know, crop ears, eyes, his noses and mouths off people and put it all together. But no, this research was specifically focused on pure artificially generated faces. Any other questions? So, I turn to Ken, if I may. Um, you asked about why the most technical limitations probably not, but the Google commercial ones, because they want their user bases governed in the way they and their market value. Yeah. Um, and they don't want to ask why that's what you were thinking about building all of the ones. And it's also, just on that note, it's maybe worth to remember that as much as I'm focused on the negativity right now of this technology with anything it does have a positive side as well there's a lot of power and anonymity right so just something uh, as maybe a a, um, a note to remember within this I'm definitely looking at how it can be used in a negative sense but with any technology there's definitely power for it, it to be used in good as well um, if there's no more questions though I will finish up there yeah